Welcome to the final episode of my baby Pokemon series. Today, I am going to be beating Pokemon Crystal with a Pichu. When I started this series, I was under the impression that Pokemon Crystal was actually quite easy. However, now this far into it, I think my ideas around the game have changed. Pokemon Crystal is quite easy if you have a good Pokemon, but if you have a Pokemon like Pichu, everything is different. If you're a frequent viewer of my channel, you will know that I hate the Pokemon Seal. Not because of its awesome design, after all this thing is quite cute. Not because of its extremely creative name. No, I hate Seal because of how inconsistent it was when I tried to optimize it against the champion while I was making my Pokemon Yellow video. I've talked about Seal so many times on the channel, and whenever I bring it up, I am usually about to talk about something that is very painful. And yeah, Pichu felt like Seal. I guess that's to be expected, because in terms of base stat totals, this thing is the weakest baby Pokemon. It shares a base stat total with Pokemon like Metapod and Kakuna. Of course, those two we assume are bad because they learn like no TM moves. They basically are just there to teach the player about evolution. Their primary move is Harden, and yeah, they're not very good. Pichu, on the other hand, initially appears like it is supposed to be a fully functioning Pokemon. Granted, then you look at its base stat distribution, and you realize how bad this thing truly is. It has 20 HP, 40 attack, 15 defense, 35 special attack and special defense, and 60 speed. It also has a medium fast growth rate, which is shared across its evolutionary line, and this one is generally not very good for solo challenges. Now, in comparison with the last two babies, Cleffa and Igglybuff, Pichu's move pool is actually quite good. It starts with Thundershock and Charm, both useful early game moves, then it learns Tail Whip, which unfortunately is not useful for it because it doesn't learn a physical move by level up. At level 8, it gets Thunder Wave, and then at level 11, it gets Sweet Kiss. I haven't made a remark about this in a former baby video, but most of them get access to Charm and Sweet Kiss, with the exceptions of Magby, Elekid, and Tyrogue. I guess they just didn't think that those babies were cute enough, and they are definitely wrong. Magby should definitely get both Charm and Sweet Kiss. That thing is very cute. Anyways, that's just a useless factoid. Now let's continue with Pichu's move pool. Through TM and HM, it gets access to the three primary normal type moves, Headbutt, Swift, and Return. And for coverage, it gets Rollout, Iron Tail, and Mud Slap. Yeah, that's basically it. This set is extremely limited. In summary, its best electric type move through level up is Thundershock. It learns nothing else. The next possible move that it can learn that is an electric type move is Thunder, and I have to buy that from the game corner for 5,500 coins. Beyond that, once it defeats Lance, it can learn Thunderbolt by the Move Tutor. This is only available in Pokemon Crystal, and then it can get Zap Cannon once you make it to Kanto. I initially ranked the babies by move pools, and here I put Pichu in the F tier, just because it is better than Tyrogue, like it has the same type attack bonus move that isn't Rock Smash. Tyrogue is by far, to this point, the worst baby. Pichu could potentially be worse than it, but I would be surprised if that's the case. Well, there's only one way to find out, so let's jump into the first playthrough. By the way, rules are in the description. I have a disclaimer about this run, which is I actually played Pichu right after I played Togepi back at the beginning of this entire series. It was initially my intent to release the videos in the order Togepi, Pichu, and then Tyrogue. However, late into the process of developing these videos, I decided to put Pichu last, mostly because I was procrastinating on doing its second playthrough. By the way, this is a little bit of not-so-subtle foreshadowing. Today, the rival's team, of course, is going to be Chikorita. It resists electric-type moves. Even with a berry, this first fight is a little bit close. Maybe I should have leveled Pichu up a little bit more than just 6 for this battle, but in the end, I managed to win. Notably, you can proceed with the playthrough if you lose that fight. However, I do count it as a failure if you lose, just because the Pokémon does want to win. The experience from the battle is very good in the early game. Unlike some of the babies like Smoochum, Pichu is not going to have to train that much in order to be able to defeat Faulkner. It already has super effective damage against his flying type Pokemon. While doing this playthrough, I thought that there was a risk in the Faulkner fight. I figured that he was going to be choosing Mud Slap against Pichu because it is super effective. That doubles the damage it's going to deal, so it has an effective power of 40. What I missed is he gets the same type of attack bonus on Tackle, so his Pokemon are actually going to pick Tackle against Pichu rather than Mud Slap. His AI has no check to see that he can lower accuracy with Mudslap, so he is not prioritizing the secondary effect. 
Because I hadn't realized this in my first playthrough, I do some additional training just outside of Violet City to level Pichu up to level 11 to ensure better damage ranges against the flying types. With that finished, I take on Faulkner. So am I going to get a one hit on the first Pidgey? And the answer is yes. That leaves only one Pokemon, the Pidgeotto, which I think I'm going to two hit. Again, I was scared here of Mudslap. I go for Thunder Wave to paralyze it and then Sweet Kiss to mess it up even more. However, then the Pidgeotto just uses Tackle and I was like, okay, sure. I go for Charm as well to lower its attack. I'm very, I'm just going to heal enough with my Berry and I didn't think Pichu was going to do that much. However, then I go for Thundershock and Pidgeotto uses Mudslap. So what must have happened here is during the test roll, he either got a critical hit with Mudslap slap or tackle missed and he got no damage with it so that's probably why he chose this move instead either way an accuracy drop in generation 2 is not nearly as bad as it is in generation 1 i'm able to hit on the next turn and with that faulkner's defeated with him out of the way gligar is truly sad because yes pichu can learn mud slap these games were truly cruel to this ground flying type it basically feels like a baby pokemon that cannot evolve or learn any good moves why game freak why I teach Pichu Mudslap in the place of Sweet Kiss, and then I backtrack to the earliest route of the game where I pick up the Pink Bow. This is going to be very useful because inside of Union Cave I can pick up the TM for Swift. And notably, Pichu actually has a higher base attack stat than special attack. This is something I always find surprising about it, as well as Pikachu. Once they reach their final form in Raichu, these stats become even, and I guess that makes sense. But it's really weird that the first two Pokemon have more attack than special attack. They are electric types after all. With Faulkner's Badge Boost and a move like Swift, I am going to be doing more damage with this normal type move instead of Thundershock. This really reminds me of Super Smash Bros, where Pichu would damage itself every time it used an electric type move. It almost feels like that in these games. The developers are trying to push you towards using physical moves with this thing instead of using electric moves. Now while I have the pink bow which can boost Swift's damage, I didn't equip it, and then I go up against Hiker Anthony to gain experience. The Geodude actually ends up not being a problem, and then the Machop comes out, goes for low kick, dealing massive damage taking Pichu down to 10 health. I use Thundershock, I'm not sure if that's the right choice, either way I would not have knocked the Machop out, and it takes Pichu down with low kick. So yeah, Hiker Anthony is the first reset for this weak electric type. It's very lucky that I saved in front of him. Now Anthony is usually quite good, after all he has custom trainer art. I'm sure that going forward there are going to be no other random Johto trainers that cause problems for Pichu. I finish off all the trainers in Slowpoke well, head into the gym, fight the people at the front of the gym, head over to the left hand side, fight the guy with the Paris, and then the weak bug type knocks Pichu out. Once again, it is good that I saved here. Now that trainer with Paris is one that I normally think about a lot. He is very annoying using status conditions, but he usually does not cause a reset like that. This time when I face him again, I do save. He paralyzes Pichu, but luckily for me it doesn't result in a reset. I finish off the final trainer in the gym, and with that I'm level 18 and ready to face Bugsy. At the start of this fight, I'll mention the fact that I have finally equipped the pink bow. It took me way too long to do that. I should have done it as soon as I picked the item up. Now, holding it for this fight does expose me to some risk against the Kakuna, because it could use Poison Sting to inflict a status on Pichu, but in this case, that doesn't happen, and I move on to the Scyther. To cut its consistency, I use Thunder Wave to paralyze it. This stops it from using Fury Cutter, but it still does damage with Quick Attack. I misclick using Swift, which does very little damage, and then on the next turn, even with Thundershock, I don't do much more. Because Quick Attack is doing so much damage, when Scyther uses it for a second time, Pichu faints. I try the fight again, making it back to the Scyther. I paralyze it this time, hoping that this is going to break the combo. For some reason, I use Swift again. Why am I using Swift? This is obviously a terrible idea. My next Thundershock hits the Scyther, taking it to orange health, but still, Pichu is not able to survive, so that is my second reset against Bugsy. While doing this first playthrough, I felt hopeless. I was just like, I'm gonna go fight the rival instead, which uh, does not seem like a good option now because he is usually very challenging, especially when his ace is Bayleaf and your Pokemon is a Pichu. I also hope everyone else has noticed that there is a clear path to victory against Bugsy. If I just spam Thundershock against the Scyther, I should knock it out before it does enough damage to Pichu to finish it off. 
I think I was hyper fixating too much on the fact that Thunder Wave is a good way to cut both the Scyther's speed as well as its consistency. Breaking combos in this fight has been a successful strategy for me in the past, but I think with Pichu, where it has super effective damage, this isn't the path to victory. So now, as I'm facing the rival, let's talk about him instead. I'm using the Paralysis strategy against the Bayleaf once again. By the way, it uses Razor Leaf critting Pichu, and I cannot understate how much damage that does. I knew that I wasn't going to win this straight up by using Swift, so I go for Mud Slap to lower its accuracy, but it does hit another Razor Leaf, and Pichu goes down. Instead of cluing into the strategy that I have against Bugsy, I go back and face Hyper Anthony, and then I train in the wild until Pichu is level 20. At this level, I went back and faced the rival, another great choice from me in this first playthrough. Things start off much worse for me this time, the Ghastly puts Pichu to sleep, and then licks it so many times, doing about one third in damage. Following that, I use Thunder Wave against the Bayleaf, and then Mud Slap to lower its accuracy, but after just one, it uses Razor Leaf and takes Pichu down to 7 health. I continued using Mud Slap until Reflect wore out, and then I started using Swift, and in a miracle, the Bayleaf actually faints without hitting me again. So I made it to his Zubat, I go for Thundershock, and the Zubat survives! That's how bad Pichu's stats are. It retaliates with Bite, and you might be scared because Pichu has 15 base defense. However, in Generation 2, Dark-type moves are special, so Pichu survives on one hit point. I cannot believe that I defeated the rival. Anyways, with him out of the way, I do have to face Bugsy next. If you're curious why, I need his badge in order to be able to use Cut in the Forest to progress with the playthrough, so that's why I'm fighting him. I two-shot both of his Cocoon Pokémon. People in the past have said, it's a Metapod, it's not a Cocoon. It is a Cocoon. They're both Cocoons. Unfortunately for me, I get poisoned on the Cocoona before the Scyther comes out. However, I actually think that that's a blessing, because then I felt like I was on the clock and I did not go for Thunder Wave. Instead, I go for Thundershock, which gets a critical hit, taking the Scyther down to red health. As a result, I'm able to finish it on the next turn and earn myself the second badge. Finally, it's time for an upgrade to Pichu's moveset. In this case, I can teach Headbutt in the place of Swift. This is a major increase to my effective power, and it also has a 30% chance to cause flinches. Pichu is relatively fast, like relatively fast when considering baby Pokemon. I just did a playthrough with Iglybuff. <laughs> that thing is not fast. Pichu feels very fast today. It also makes its way through all the trainers surrounding Goldenrod City fairly quickly. I have no hiccups here like I had against Hiker Anthony or the Paris Bug Catcher, and with that I head back into the department store, trade an extra Abra to gain access to the Machop that's holding the Goldberry just in case I need it, and then I head into the gym, defeat all the trainers, and now I'm ready to face Whitney. The first question in this battle, will the Clefairy get Metronome and use some ridiculous move like Earthquake? The answer is no, it just goes for Double Slap, but it does hit four times, and it does more than one third to Pichu. That is the most I have ever seen a Double Slap do to a Pokemon. Okay, now I have to face the Miltank. Remember when I was mentioning that Pichu is fast? Yes, it is faster than Miltank, so I can cause flinches to break combos here. To really ensure that the Miltank is not going to set up too many rollouts, I go for Thunder Wave and it prevents Miltank's attack on the first turn. That's a good start, then Headbutt does about a quarter and it causes a flinch, I go for Headbutt again, getting a second flinch in a row, and you will not believe it, but Pichu flinches the Miltank for a third time. And so I knock it out without it doing a single hit point of damage to Pichu. It is very rare for the Clefairy to do more damage than her terrifying ace. With her badge, I get a boost to my speed stat. That one's not super relevant, but I also get a 12.5% boost to all normal type damage, which really is going to help Pichu out. Next, I force myself to defeat the Sudowoodo. By the way, I did heal for this one, so that's really good. I also remembered that electric moves can attack rock type Pokemon. Unfortunately for Pichu though, they're only doing about a quarter per hit. And as a result, the Sudowoodo takes me down to orange health, then goes for low kick, and Pichu survives on one hit point. I cannot believe it. My next Thundershock does enough damage, and the Sudowoodo goes down. I almost had a reset against it, even when I was playing well. As I head into Ecritique City, I want to mention a small trick that I do here. I go into the Pokemon Center right away. It's kind of annoying, you have to see all the dialogue from Bill, but then I'm going to heal here. This sets my waypoint to Ecritique City. After that, I head north, grabbing a hidden Hyper Potion, and then I take on the Kimono Girls. If I'm streaming, I'm probably going to come back here later after I'm trying to use Surf in Olivine City. By the way, none of their teams are strong against Pichu, so I take easy victories here and earn myself the HM for Surf. 
After that I head to the lighthouse so I can defeat all the trainers along the way as well as all the mandatory battles there. This gives me more experience ensuring that I'm at a higher level when I teleport back to Critique City to face the rival in Burned Tower. While I do this battle, hold on to the idea of where my waypoint is set, it is still set to Aquatique City, because that is going to be relevant after this battle. Okay, so Haunter is first, Thundershock does less than half, which means it is able to put a curse on me and survive to the next turn. But in Generation 2 that doesn't matter, because if I knock the Haunter out on the next turn, which I obviously do, I take no curse damage anyways. Next, I go for Mudslap against the Magnemite, finishing it in a single hit, and at this point in the run I have taught Return over Headbutt, because it has a higher effective power. This allows me to do half to the Bayleaf, it sets up Reflect, so it is going to take two more turns to knock out. I take Curse damage, as well as Razor Leaf damage, but Pichu survives on Orange Health, and I finish it off. All that's left is Zubat, Thundershock easily one hits, and with that, the Burn Tower section of the game is completed. I will note here I use an escape rope to get out after releasing the Legendary Beasts. This is just so I can skip the dialogue with Yusin, it is not actually mandatory. After that I head into the gym, defeating the guy with the five ghosts. He has been relevant in other challenges, but today Pichu's Thundershock is dealing enough damage to knock out each one of them in a single hit. However, I don't have the same damage ranges against the other trainers in the gym. Now you might think that I would want the Magnet to improve those damage ranges against Morty, but I don't think that that's the right choice. Instead, I want the Mint Berry. With it equipped, let's see how this battle goes. First up is Ghastly. I go for Thundershock, and it doesn't knock it out, so it is able to use Curse and knock itself out. Next is Haunter. I go for Thundershock, and it does less than half. Okay, that's really bad. The Haunter burns my Mint Berry by using Hypnosis. I finish it on the next turn, taking no more Curse damage, but then I do pathetic damage to the Gengar. Thundershock is doing a quarter, so there is no way that I'm going to knock it out without fainting to Curse. Not to mention it actually hits a Hypnosis, followed by a Dream Eater, so that's it. I was 100% sure that I couldn't defeat Morty without a lot of luck from either Mudslap or Thunder Wave, so I'm going to go do some training instead. First though, let's remember that my waypoint is set to Acritique City. I can just jump down this ledge and grab the magnet from Sunny, he's here every Sunday by the way, and then I can use Abra to teleport me back to Acritique City so I don't have to walk through any grass or take the long route around. Now continuing to have my waypoint set to Acritique City is very helpful as I head to the Lake of Rage to defeat more trainers. Normally I want to be able to just teleport back to Akriti City after defeating them all, but with Pichu I'm taking a lot of damage and I'm going to run out of power points at some point, so I decided to heal in Mahogany Town so that my waypoint is set there, then I can just get back to the Pokemon Center quickly to do additional training. While I do this I'll just mention that Hidden Power is banned in my first playthrough, it does say that it's a Dark type move, that's specifically because this Pichu has perfect stats. Once I reach level 38 I figure that Pichu is ready to face Morty again, so let's see how this goes. Thundershock is still not a one hit on the first gas so I'm cursed again. The Haunter uses Nightshade instead of Hypnosis, so I still have my Mint Berry for the Gengar, and here I'm hoping for a 3 hit, but it doesn't look like I have the damage range. Gengar does miss a Hypnosis, but I'm still taking too much damage, and as a result, Pichu goes down. I tried the fight again, hoping that the Haunter would not use Nightshade and deal damage to me, and I do make it to the Gengar with full health, so that's very convenient. Once again though, I am taking Curse damage, my Mint Berry gets used right away, I go for Thundershock, taking the Gengar to orange health, it uses Hypnosis, putting Pichu to sleep, and once again it's able to polish Pichu off with Dream Eater. I mentioned this yesterday in the Eagly Buff video, what I really should be doing here is using Rollout to defeat Morty, however, remember that this Pichu playthrough was played second overall, so I didn't have that insight yet, I figured that I just had to defeat him with Thundershock, Mudslap, and Thunder Wave. And after training to level 40, I am able to do it, I paralyze the Gengar right away, it's not able to hit me, then I use Mudslap to lower its accuracy, which by the way is actually doing decent damage when compared with Thundershock, it's about the same amount and I am able to 3-shot the Gengar using this ground type move. All that's left is Haunter, and I can finish it off with 2 turns from Thundershock and earn myself the 4th badge. Now 3 of the baby Pokemon are normal types, so facing Chuck early on has felt a little bit scary, but with Pichu that is not the case. And I can also face all the trainers around the Whirl Islands to gain a lot of experience before I even head into the gym. This brings Pichu up to level 45 before I face the first Black Belt here. Return just one-shots the Hitmonlee, so it doesn't get a chance to use a powerful fighting type move. Return one hits the Hitmonchan on the next guy's team, and then I sweep through Black Belt Nob's team. I do take some damage here, but not enough to be worried about. With them out of the way, let's take on Chuck. Up first is Primeape. Pichu has the outspeed on both of his Pokemon. I go for Return, and it doesn't one-hit. However, Primeape just misses Fury Swipes, and I knock it out on the next turn. 
Okay, time for the Polyrath. I have taken this slightly risky choice here to go with a Magnet for this fight instead of the Mint Berry. Luckily for me, the Polyrath just misses a Dynamic Punch and I knock it out with the second Thundershock. The next portion of the game is extremely uneventful. I defeat all the Rockets, head into Price's Gym doing extra training here against the Plentiful Water types, and then I face the Gym Leader himself. Um, one of the worst major battles in the entire game. He has two water types today, so Pichu is definitely not going to struggle. While he does have a ground type, it doesn't know any ground moves, as I've mentioned many times before. That being said, I got a little caught off guard here, because he sends it in second. I thought it was going to be Dugong, so I spam A through Thundershock and do no damage to the pile of swine, and as a result, I get hit by Blizzard, but it really does not do that much. I go for return, it does more than half. Pile of swine tries the powerful ice type move again, but this time it misses, and I finish it on the next turn. After that, I use Thundershock, two-shotting the Dugong, and I've earned myself technically my sixth badge, but the seventh badge overall. This one's great for Pichu, it gives a boost to my special attack stat, which is really going to help with Thundershock's damage. Now, unlike the previous two babies, where I could teach Fire Blast from the game corner, Pichu has to go up against Jasmine using only Mud Slap. To give it a little bit more damage here, I surf south of Goldenrod City, fight all of these trainers, and pick up the Soft Sand. And with that, I'm ready to face Jasmine, this one is probably going to be pretty awful. Let's see how it goes. In the first fight, I forgot the soft sand. Luckily for me, Mudslap one-shots both of the Magnemites. I'm going to have a little bit less damage against the Steelix, but essentially the only way I have to win here is by using Mudslap to drop its accuracy, and then eventually polishing it off with Return after Jasmine uses her Hyper Potion. Even with its accuracy dropped all of the way, the Steelix is still able to hit and Pichu goes down. I don't think it makes any sense to train more, I just have to get lucky here with accuracy. I have one more reset on the Steelix before I finally get the luck I need and finish it off, earning myself the 6th badge, but in this case the 7th badge. Okay, so the next question is, will I be able to one-shot Petrol's weak coughings? Here, Return is going to do more damage to them, even though it's a physical move. I crit the first one, knocking it out in a single hit, and then the second one survives on a sliver of health. Luckily, it did not go for Smokescreen. Pichu gets a second lucky critical hit against the third coughing, and then Petrol sends in his wheezing. This one is going to be a two hit. It doesn't go for Smokescreen or Explosion, instead choosing Sludge. It doesn't poison, and I finish it off. From there, the rest of the fight's easy. He really needs to mess you up earlier on in the battle, rather than later on. The next major battle is against the rival in the underground. Thundershock doesn't one-shot the Golbat. By the way, this thing always has more special defense than I expected to have. It just goes for Bite, doing chip damage, I take it out. Haunter goes for Mean Luck, and I finish it with two Mud Slaps. Then against Sneasel, return one hits. Then return does a lot of damage to Meganium. It sets up Reflect, but even despite the field move, I am able to knock it out on the next turn. I complete the secondary portion of Radio Tower, head through Ice Path. Here I'm a little bit sad because the Never Melt Ice is not useful. I do not get any ice type moves. So Pichu is going to be relying on Return as it goes up against Claire. The question in this fight is will I one hit the first Dragonair? And the answer is no, I will not, which allows it to paralyze Pichu, and from there things are not going to go well. I don't one hit the second Dragonair, so that means that this is not a roll, I am likely just going to two hit all of them. Because I'm paralyzed I miss an attack and the second Dragonair is able to put in serious work. Pichu only has 24 health by the time her third Dragonair comes out, so yeah, I'm going to have a reset here. One potential solution to Thunder Wave is using Rest so that I can heal the status condition. Unlike in Generation 1, when you remove Paralysis, your Pokémon speed is restored to its original value. In this fight I drop the ball by getting a little bit too fancy. I try to use Mud Slap so that I can lower the Dragonair's accuracy, and then use Rest to heal after that. However, Paralysis prevents me from using Rest and Pichu goes down. I've been attempting this fight at level 57. What if I level up to level 58 to go over a damage rounding threshold? Maybe that will give me the one hit on some of the Dragonairs. And in this case, I am right, the first Dragonair goes down with a single hit. However, I roll worse damage on the second one so it survives, but then it misses Thunder Wave and I finish it off for free. Okay Pichu, please have a good roll against the third Dragonair. And in this case, it gets it. So, I have made it to the Kingdra. This might be it. Return does more than half. Kingdra goes for Dragon Breath. It doesn't do very much, and it also doesn't cause paralysis, so Claire is defeated. The next major battle is in Victory Road against the Rival. Anytime I am watching footage of me doing this battle without a paralyzed Cure Berry, when I have a weak Pokemon that is not going to one-shot the Magneton, I get really stressed. And in this case, it does cause paralysis. 
Also notably, the Magneton was the second Pokemon in the battle. As a result, there are four more Pokemon to defeat when I am going to be moving slower, taking damage, and likely not moving on some turns. Paralysis is by far the worst status condition to have when you are doing a solo run. In this case, it gets even worse because I get confused, and as a result, Pichu has a loss here. If I could backport something from new generations that would make these solo challenges so much easier for electric types, it would be their immunity to paralysis. But unfortunately, that was an addition that was added to the series starting in Generation 6, so I've got a while until my electric Pokémon are not going to be getting paralyzed. In the next fight, I have the Paralyzed Curberry, so the Magneton does not inflict the status condition, and that allows Pichu to make it past the rival. With that, Pichu is ready to take on the Elite Four. Will is first, and I expect him to be fairly easy to defeat, because electric moves are quite good against his team. Unfortunately though, I do not knock out the first Zatu in a single hit, so it is able to confuse Pichu. I hit myself on the next turn, and it does a lot of damage. That shows the discrepancy between Pichu's attack stat and his defense stat. I take psychic damage, knock the Zatu out, move on to the Jinx. Return is going to be my best choice here, but Pichu hits itself and Jinx finishes me off. Okay, let's try that again, and I mean exactly that, because Pichu gets confused right away once again. And then I make it to the Jinx getting a little bit better luck, but here I get worse luck and the Jinx finishes me off. By the way, I was way too stubborn here, I really should have just given Pichu the Bitterberry right away and forsaken the Magnet, but I don't do that in the next fight. I manage to make it to the Slowbro, which is great. However, this thing gets set up with Curse, then strikes back with Body Slam, which does a lot. I thought I could use Rest here to heal. I am not going to one-shot the next Zatu anyways. However, the Slowbro just knocks me out, so I have to try again. In the next fight, I'm in a worse position against it, and so it's able to finish me off with Psychic without setting up. Okay, so it's time for a moveset change. I head to the game corner where I buy a bunch of coins. By the way, I am over buying coins because I'm going to need Thunderbolt later on anyways. After that, I'm going to buy TM25, which of course is Thunder. Then I need to head into Slowpoke Well, push the boulder, and head to the basement floor where I can grab TM18, which of course is Rain Dance. Once the rain is set up, then Thunder bypasses accuracy checks, meaning it is always going to hit, even if I get afflicted by something like Sand Attack, which could be relevant against Karen. With this power Powerful electric type move, I'm also able to one shot the Zatu, return one shots the Jinx, then I have to knock the Executor out over two turns. This is a bit frustrating because it is stalling Rain's counter out. By the way, you cannot refresh a weather condition until it expires, which does sometimes cause some issues. Like in this case, the Zatu comes out and I really don't want to get hit by it, so instead I just go for Thunder even though it has 70% accuracy and the Zatu goes down. I once again have to go for the YOLO Thunder on the Slowbro. Luckily it hits, and with that, Pichu has defeated Will. Okay, it's time for Koga. What could possibly go wrong? Well, the Eridos could set up double team and then do Baton Pass into a Pokemon like Magneton, which is obviously a ground type. I expect everyone here has seen my videos before because this is the eighth video in a series. There's a lot of context missing if you haven't seen the previous videos. Fortress could go for Explosion, but Thunder just one hits it. I'm able to two hit the Venomoth, setting up Rain Dance. Notably, it does confuse me, but this doesn't impact the fight. I still managed to take out the Muck, followed by the Crobat, and now I'm moving on to Baroon. No. Unlike Cleffa and Igglybuff, I expected that this fight wouldn't be that bad. And then the Hitmontop hits with Dig, and uh, that did way more than it should have. Normally this thing is doing chip damage, but Pichu took about a third. I finish it off on the next turn, Brock sends in Onyx, and uh, I can't believe I'm going to say this. The Onyx is actually going to take a while to knock out because I only have Return. And then it goes for Earthquake, which deals massive damage to Pichu. I am not going to be able to heal fast enough with Returns, so that is a reset against the Onyx of all Pokemon. Okay, so I'm going to try the fight again. This time I'm putting Iron Tail in the place of Return so that I have super effective damage against the Rock type. Unfortunately, it does not get the one hit and Onyx sets up Sandstorm, which in Generation 2 does one eighth damage per turn. So this move is actually really good. I tried to reestablish Rain Dance to remove it, but Earthquake knocks Pichu out. The next fight is not very nice despite me getting by the Onyx for the first time. Him only misses high jump kick and crashes, so I knock it out for free, but then Mock Punch takes Pichu down to red health, and Hitmonchan survives my return. Okay, so Pichu faints to Mock Punch. I try it again, and the Onyx defeats me, and then after the next Onyx defeat, 
I decided that it was time to black out and look for alternative strategies. When I do my first playthroughs, I don't really investigate the Pokemon that in depth. I don't put together a detailed plan. I just go into the run and see what I can do. What that means is that most of the time while I am training and grinding for levels, I figure out the strategy that's going to work against a particular trainer. And that is exactly when I had the light bulb moment here with Pichu. I backtrack into Johto, grabbing another return TM. By the way, you can get one of these every Sunday, so there is an infinite number of them in the game. After that, I head into Mount Mortar using the middle entrance and surfing up the waterfall. Then I take this path through this maze-like area. I'm showing it to you now because I'm sure a lot of you don't know how to navigate this area. As a kid, I never came in here because I played mostly silver version. And because HMs are so annoying, I just never had a flash user on my team. Anyways, my goal in here is to pick up TM40, which is Defense Curl. Once again, I fight my way past Will and Koga having no resets and make it back to Bruno. For this battle, I decide to teach Defense Curl in the place of Rain Dance. I think I am kind of forced into that. I think I am going to need Rest to defeat Lance, and I need Return to knock out all of the Hitmons as well as the Machamp. Plus, Rest is useful in this fight specifically because I can use it in combination with Defense Curl to heal after setting up on the Hitmon top. I heal one more time, ensuring that I have the highest possible health. I knock Bruno's lead out and move on to the Onyx. Against it, I have to use Return. That means that Sandstorm is going to be doing a lot of damage here, but due to getting very lucky, and I mean very lucky, I knock the Onyx out in two critical hits. Following that, I'm able to one-shot the Hitmonlee, heal against the Hitmonchan twice to stall out the Sandstorm counter, and then I move on to Machamp. Okay, let's hope that Crosschop does not get a critical hit, and you know what happens? It gets a critical hit, and Pichu goes down in a single turn. So yeah, Pichu faints after all of that. That was definitely frustrating, but in the next battle, Crosschop does not crit. I survive it easily, and finish Bruno. I talked before why I didn't replace Return for the Bruno fight, because it would have been really nice to keep Rain Dance for this battle against Karen. Luckily for me though, the Umbreon just misses Sand Attack. However, Pichu just also barely misses the range it needs to two-shot the Umbreon. Still, I don't have my accuracy lowered, and I move on to the Vile Plume, which I luckily dodge Paralysis on, knocking it out over two turns. I have to Thunder the Gengar, it hits, causing Paralysis, but Gengar still moves, using Curse, knocking itself out. Okay, this is going not that bad. I use Return, it takes Houndoom, down to low red health, but then Karen uses the Max Potion, and due to Curse, Pichu goes down. Are you ready for another lucky fight? I get better damage ranges against the Umbreon, knocking it out in two turns despite confusion. Next is Vileplume, which once again misses Stun Spore, so I knock it out, moving on to the Gengar. Thunder hits, in this case getting a better damage range, knocking the Gengar out in a single hit. Then, Return takes the Houndoom to red health, it does some damage with Flamethrower, but I move twice, finishing it off, making it to the Murkrow, which is obviously her weakest Pokemon, so I one-shot it and with that, Pichu has made it to the champion. Gyarados is first, I go for Thunder and it crits, so yeah, obviously that's a one-shot. However, the Dragonites that are next are the real sticky point here, I need to be able to two-shot them. And it looks like Return is just barely not doing enough. Okay, never mind, after the second hit, I do knock the first one out. I get a better damage roll against the second Dragonite, it paralyzes me, and then I finish it off. Lance chooses his ace next, and I continue going for Return, doing less than half, and then critting, finishing that Dragonite off in two hits. All right, Pichu might actually be able to do this on its first attempt. I did not think that that would be possible. Aerodactyl moves first, going for Rock Slide, which, okay, causes a flinch, so Pichu is going to lose this one. I actually got quite close in that last fight, and that gave me a false sense that I was very close to doing it. In my second and third attempts, I lost to Lance's Dragonite, trying to prevent the status condition to ensure that I would move first against the Aerodactyl. After this defeat, I had to concede that this strategy is just not the best one. Unfortunately for me, I'm going to have to teach Pichu Rollout. This move is actually a lot better against Lance than it is against other trainers, mostly because the Gyarados loves to set up with Rain Dance on the first turn, giving you a turn to establish Defense Curl before going for the Rock-type move. After that, I crit the Gyarados, knocking it out in a single turn. Hopefully I will still have enough damage for the first Dragonite, and I do. I move on to the second one, rollout continues, knocking it out, as well as the following ace Dragonite. Okay, so I have one more rollout in me before it resets. It hits against the Aerodactyl and finishes it off, which is really convenient because Charizard takes four times damage from rollout, so when I use this move, 
It just goes down to a single hit despite it being the first turn. And with that, Pichu has defeated Lance with a time of 2 hours 18 minutes and 34 seconds. It had 28 resets and is level 68. Summarizing my experience with Pichu so far, things have been really rough. It has struggled in a lot of different places, and I wish I could say that that was about to end because the Cantonian gym leaders are generally very easy, but that is not the case today. Up first I have to face Erica. I'm going into this with the set that I had for Lance, so return is my primary form of damage. I knock the Tangela out, sustaining a little bit of damage, and move on to the Jump Love. Instead of establishing rollout here, because I didn't want to miss later on, I just go for return, hoping for the one hit. However, Jump Luff survives, and it uses Leech Seed. Okay, it's a bit annoying. I continue going for return against the Victory Bell, taking it down to low health. I have some health sapped from Leech Seed, and Victory Bell sets up Sunny Day. I finish it off, and next is Blossom. Um, it knows Solar Beam, by the way, and it survives return, but luckily just chooses Petal Dance doing not very much and I finish it off. I think if it had gone for Solar Beam there, I would have lost. Against Sabrina I don't have any problems because I'm quite fast and I have a good physical move in the form of Return. Following that I take on Misty, which because of my type advantage also is not a problem. Next is Surge, I don't really have anything good against his Magneton, but this one also doesn't have Thunder Wave, so I'm not scared of it. Also defeating him here finally gives me access to the badge boost for electric type moves, just in time for Pichu not to have one. I clear out the Snorlax and head towards Brock, who uh, is of course the next gym leader we need to talk about. Normally he is one of the worst gym leaders in all of Kanto because his team is so bad. He has a Graveler and a Rhyhorn and an Onyx. None of those Pokemon are good when you are this far into the game. They do resist it, but I figured I could do enough damage to eventually take him out. However, then the Graveler goes for Rollout too, and its damage stacks up faster than mine because I don't resist it. So yeah, I have a loss to Barak. I tried a different approach. What if I set up with Defense Curl and then sweep with Return after using Rest? But then Graveler, yes, the Graveler, gets a critical hit with Earthquake, and that is enough to finish Pichu off. This is the first time I have ever done this, but I am not going to fight Brock now. I'm just going to skip him and head towards Blaine. This is obviously the right choice. Blaine's going to be so easy, right? I just go in without a save. Why would you save? He's a Cantonian gym leader. He's completely terrible. Of course, Meg Cargo is first. It's a rock type, but this thing is usually complete trash. So I figured I'll just spam Return, knock it out slowly, and then sweep through his other two Pokemon. But Meg Cargo puts in some serious work, taking Pichu down to orange health before I finish it off. Um... That's not good. However, I'm moving first, so I'm able to knock out the Magmar, as well as the Rapidash. No, actually not the Rapidash. It does survive because Pichu is very weak. It uses Fire Blast and Pichu faints. I was so frustrated here because this reset takes me back in front of Brock. Okay, so uh, once again, I'm gonna skip him and I'm gonna go back to Blaine, but this time I'm gonna save before Blaine because apparently this fight is difficult for Pichu. This time, instead of trying to get through it quickly with the least number of turns possible using Return, I am just gonna set up defense curl and then go for rollout and hope that I don't miss. I get lucky in this fight not missing at all, and with that I've moved on to Janine, who of course is easy for Pichu. Here we can see just how bad her team is, because Pichu takes literally zero damage during this fight. With her finished, I have to backtrack to face Brock again. This time I go for the rollout strategy, I manage to take out the Graveler for the first time, move on to the Rhyhorn, which I one-shot with rollout. Okay, that's good. Next is Onyx. Rollout continues, finishing it in a single hit, and from here, things should be easier. I continue Rollout against the Omastar. It hits with Surf. Rollout misses, and the Omastar finishes me off. Yeah, of course it does. The water type beats Pichu. That makes so much sense. I guess I should have just got Thunderbolt, but what move would have I put it in the place of? I wanted Return for Kanto. Obviously, Rollout seems like it was required now that I have faced Blaine. Defense Curl combos with it, and I am going to need Rest for red. Instead of going back to Johto and learning this move from the tutor, I am instead going to teach Iron Tail in the place of return because I didn't end up using this against Bruno. Now with the super effective damage against rock types, yeah, it's still close. The Kabutops takes me down to red health, so I have to use rest to heal up, and then I'm able to finish it off. Omastar comes out, hits Surf, Pichu survives on one health. Luckily for me, Iron Tail does not miss, and the Omastar goes down. So, I've beaten Brock. And with that, earned the right to face blue. It's time for the Generation 2 core moveset, Return, Curse, and Rest. For this fight, I have additionally also brought Iron Tail with me because I think it will be useful against the Rhydon. 
I set up to full with Curse on the Pidgeotto. It can't do very much to Pichu because his best move against me is Quick Attack. I finish it with Return. He sends in Rhydon next. I go for Iron Tail and knock it out. Alakazam is his next choice, of course it outspeeds, it goes for Psychic, and Pichu faints. And now we are going to see a brief montage of Pichu losing to Blue over and over and over again. The reason I kept doing all of these attempts is that Curse is usually so strong. I thought that it was so good that it would make even baby Pokemon have no issues near the end of the game. However, that does not seem to be the case. Pichu seems to be the Pokemon that is just bad enough that it is not able to use this strategy. I think Smoochum would have also struggled with this strategy if it didn't just have another viable alternative. That is, because with low defense, even when you set it up to plus 6, the opponent can still deal decent damage. Of course, Pichu also has low special defense, so Curse really doesn't help there. So I think I need to level Pichu up more. I fight Cal, and then I also fight a bunch of trainers throughout Johto, occasionally coming back to get one reset here and there against Blue. By the time I'm level 78, I'm heading towards Mount Moon, because I've almost defeated all the trainers in Kanto, and I'm going to get experience from the rival battle here. I very rarely talk about this fight, so many people have requested that I do it in every playthrough, however he's just not that interesting, so I didn't feel like it would be a good addition to my series, plus it would just bloat the playtime and Crystal is already long enough. I say that as we head into the fourth hour of playtime with Pichu. Yes, this one definitely could be as bad as Tyro. As I defeat the rival, I just want to note that his Golbat has not yet evolved into Crobat. This is because there is one more battle with him which you can actually repeat, it's in the Dragon's Den. I have never once done that battle since starting my channel, however, I love the flavor that they gave to it by letting the Golbat evolve to a Crobat, showing his character development from a ruthless trainer into a trainer who realized the errors of his ways and began to love his Pokemon. With a little bit more training in Kanto out of the way, I head back to Blue at level 80. And this time I change my strategy to hope give Pichu a better chance. I set up with Curse only once. That takes my speed down to 126. This means I can outspeed the Rhydon. I do take some damage from the Alakazam. However, I can also move first against the Executor, knocking it out, sustaining no damage because it tried Solar Beam, and then Blue sends in Arcanine. It goes for Flamethrower, burns Pichu, and that's a reset. Ah, oh, I thought I had planned well enough for this. Anyways, let's try again. And in this fight, instead of attacking, the Alakazam sets up Reflect, which is actually really bad, because then the Executor is going to have a chance to do something. In this case, it gets Leech Seed, survives my third return, uses Solar Beam, and crits Pichu. Alright, I have no way to have kept track of this, but this feels like one of my least lucky playthroughs of all time. I don't know if that is actually because of luck, or if it is because Pichu is so bad. Lately, I have been really challenging myself to not use the excuse, oh, I just got unlucky there, because that really disables all of the faculties that I have in place to try and improve at the game. If I think I am getting unlucky, then I am not going to try to improve. I will just keep trying the fight over and over again, continue to get unlucky, and just become a keyboard-smashing rage machine. But if I look at my play and I say, okay, I'm probably doing something wrong here, then I can adapt and hopefully achieve a different result. If I use Curse to go up to plus 3, then I still outspeed the Rhydon. This means I can knock it out without sustaining damage from Earthquake. Alakazam is going to attack anyways. The Executor likely isn't, because it's either going to go for Leech Seed or Solar Beam, both of which will allow me to use Return and knock it out. After that, I arrive at the Arcanine, now with enough damage to finish it off using Return. However, this does come at a cost, because I don't have much health left over when the final Gyarados comes out. I am hoping that this will be the perfect amount, you might say, uh, a nice amount of health. And in this case, it is. I survived the Gyarados' Hydro Pump, and with plus three, Pikachu's Return takes it out. At long last, Pichu has made it to the final trainer in my first playthrough. Starting the fight off, you will notice that my Pichu is now level 90. I was very disciplined during this run not to use my rare candies until right before red. I am so grateful I did that, by the way, because that is hopefully going to give me an easy win here. This first fight I used to test my damage ranges. I go for return against Pikachu, knocking it out in a single hit, and then I make the same choice against the Espeon, however this one survives, uses Reflect, and then I knock it out on the next turn. Okay, now I have made it to the Snorlax, it's going to use one Amnesia, this is hopefully going to give me the time I need to set up with Curse. I get bad luck here though, because the Snorlax uses Body Slam and it gets a crit right away, finishing Pichu off. I tried the same strategy again, but it can play out differently. 
If the Espeon goes for Psychic instead of Reflect, then the Snorlax is going to see that it doesn't have to set up, it can just go for the attack. Body Slam does a lot, and despite setting up with Curse to try to take less damage, it is able to finish Pichu off. Once again, we are seeing here that Curse does not do the magic that it normally does if your defense stat is fairly low. However, in the next battle, I am able to get set up, and then I knock the Snorlax out with plus three, moving on to Red's final three Pokemon. First up is Venusaur, but I'm still asleep. I have taught Sleep Talk by this point in the run, by the way. I wake up using Return, but with plus three, I am not able to knock out the Venusaur, just barely, by the way, giving it time to do damage with Solar Beam. But then against the Charizard, it just moves first and knocks me out with Flamethrower. My mistake in the previous fight was using Sleep Talk to knock out the Snorlax. If I'm able to go into the battle against Venusaur without the Sleep status, then I can use Return to knock it out without sustaining any damage from Solar Beam. In this case though, it just sets up Sunny Day boosting Charizard's damage, so I move on to the Blastoise with very low health, and it finishes me with Blizzard. That being said, I thought I could maybe play around this and gain back some health using Protect in the next battle, but here Venusaur just goes for Solar Beam, so I knock it out without the Sun getting set up. As a result, Red sends in Blastoise next. It sets up Rain Dance, I one-shot it with Return, and now with Flamethrower's power cut due to the weather, Pichu is able to survive, get a Return in, and Charizard goes down. So I was able to beat Pokemon Crystal with a Pichu in 3 hours, 19 minutes, and 41 seconds of real time. This was with 50 resets at level 90, and a game time of 10 hours and 34 minutes. Despite this playthrough being extremely frustrating, it still was significantly better than Tyrogue. While Tyrogue was able to get through most of the game faster than Pichu, it ran into way more problems when it started facing Red. I had to level it all the way to level 99 before the end of the game, so Pichu's game time lead is absolutely hilarious. It has a moderate advantage throughout most of the playthrough, then drops time at blue. However, the graph just goes vertical at that point, and Tyrogue ends up with a 3 hour deficit by the end of the playthrough. You can also see that here in this graph comparing the two game times. They are mostly in lockstep throughout the game until they get to Will, then Tyro progresses very quickly whereas Pichu did not. After that, Pichu slows down at Blue, and Tyro really slows down at Red. Of course my favorite metric is real time, so looking at that graph we can see that it is very much related to the game time graph. That is because with baby Pokemon the solution is generally not updating your strategy, it is usually just going and doing more grinding. And speaking of grinding, and coming back to the point about procrastination that I made at the very start of the video, yeah, it took me a long time to summon the courage to do another Pichu run. And then when I did, this happened. So I have defeated Claire, I'm going to train on all the trainers before Victory Road, and then I fight this guy who has a Quagsire, it knows Earthquake, and of course it finishes Pichu off. You'll also notice at this point in the run I have 6 resets. I was very frustrated by this point because I felt that the run was not as consistent as I wanted it to be. I had also restarted several times after frustrating early game resets similar to the loss that I had against Hiker Anthony in my first playthrough. It is always my goal to get the best time possible with each Pokemon that I use. I toughed it through the annoyances in the early game in this playthrough, made it back to red, and this time you will note that my Pichu is only level 81. In testing, I had found that I could defeat him at a lower level, however it is just a little bit more risky but still possible. I also figured that I could just set up on the Pikachu because I resist its attacks. This makes Snorlax much less scary and the rest of the fight more consistent. That being said, I am going into the fight against Red at two hours and 20 minutes. I was really happy with this time. It is going to be almost an hour faster than my previous run, unless Red beats me over and over and over and over. And that is exactly what happens here. So much so that I update my strategy to use the Quick Claw instead of the leftovers. Even then, I reset more, and more, and more, and by the time 2 hours and 45 minutes had come around, I was crushed. I really wanted this major improvement for Pichu, but unfortunately it's just not going to be possible. I ended up discarding this entire playthrough and just not completing it. And as a result, I procrastinated even longer because I really did not want to come back and do the third run. I tried to do a third run, and then I had way more resets against early game trainers, I got frustrated, and then lapsed into a long session of procrastination. To really give you a sense of how long that procrastination took, 
The current date is November 1st when I am recording this voiceover, and I recorded the second Pichu playthrough that I failed on September 29th. Today, on November 1st, I have still not recorded the third Pichu playthrough. So, I'm going to stop recording voiceover right now, I'm going to fire up Pokemon Crystal, and I'm going to beat it with Pichu, technically for a second time. But this does, for me, feel like my third attempt. So, here is how it went. Luckily for me, the early game is fairly straightforward for Pichu. This time I do some additional training and take on the rival at level 7. By the way, this fight was still pretty close, even though I have a berry, but I am still able to win. After that, I train to level 10, where I take on Faulkner. By the way, this fight is not hard at all, after I realize that Mud Slap is not going to be his go-to move. Now, the next section of the game is unfortunately significantly harder for Pichu. This rocket is actually a major problem. I restarted some runs against him earlier on. In this attempt, I went into the fight knowing that I could lose, and that I was going to black out if that ended up happening. Happening. The reason that he's so problematic is that the Rattatas can set up Tail Whip, and they can also use Quick Attack, so even if you are faster, there's no way to move first against them. Luckily for me, on my second attempt against him, I do not have a reset. Maybe this guy deserves channel art, although I think that he's only going to be problematic if you are using a Pichu. The next battle that is a little bit tricky is against Bugsy. Grinding against all the trainers up until this point in the game means that I am not faster than the Scyther. Because of that fact alone, it is the best to go for Thunder Wave turn 1 here, and then use Thundershock to knock the Scyther out. In order to win, I am going to have to have it be paralyzed once, hopefully breaking Fury Cutter's combo, although it's worth noting that Quick Attack is still dealing a lot of damage. I considered potentially using Charm here, however in the end I decided not to do that, just because I can crit if I am staying on the offensive. Pichu just barely squeezes through with only one reset, and now I have to face the rival, and this fight is also very difficult. I'm going to need Mudslap for the Bayleaf to cut its consistency just a little bit, so if the Ghastly uses Hypnosis, puts me to sleep, and then uses Spite to drain all of Mudslap's PP, it is a quick reset. Granted, I could use Thundershock against the Ghastly, but then it is more likely to hit Hypnosis and waste my time, so I figured going for Mudslap turn 1 was safe enough. The entire experience of playing with Pichu just made me realize that in Azalea Town specifically, there is going to be some inconsistency, and I just need to make peace with that. If I tried to get through this run with zero resets, I think I would drive myself crazy, and overall Pichu's results would end up worse, because likely I would have to grind so many wild Pokemon to gain a level that's consistent in both of these fights. With the rival defeated, things are going to start to slowly improve for Pichu. Whitney is the next major battle, and there is an absolutely critical damage rounding threshold here. If Pichu is level 27, it has a 27% chance to four hit the mill tank with headbutt, but if it's level 28, just one level higher, it has a guaranteed four hit. That is a 73% increase from just having one level. Of course, it is possible to have a reset or two here. Once again, I am relying on Thunder Wave and potentially Mud Slap, but overall, I think just Thunder Wave with headbutt for potential flinches is the best option. My second fight is very close, with Pichu surviving on only one hit point, but a win is a win. And honestly, there isn't any extra experience available to this point in the run, so once again, it's better to just go into this fight and be a little bit inconsistent, but overall save a lot of real time. With the Sudowoodoo cleared, now the run is going to get much easier, because I can head to the Lake of Rage, pick up the TM for Hidden Power, and in this case I'm going to use my favorite type of Hidden Power, which is Hidden Power Ice. The reason it's so good is it gives me reliable special damage against Morty, and it's also going to help against Claire, Lance, and then later on Brock. I can't believe I just said that. Yes, I need hidden power for Brock. I take on Chuck next, there's no resets here, overall the battle is fairly straightforward. I have to two-shot both of his Pokémon no matter what held item I hold, so using the Mint Berry is just overall safer. While we watch this battle play out, I want to mention my philosophy around this run. When I did my second attempt, I wanted to get my level as low as possible to save as much time as I could. However, that ends up not being the correct strategy for Pichu. I really need to over-invest in training throughout the entire run. Essentially, any time I see a trainer that I can fight, I am going to fight that person. This is one of the few runs where I actually am not using repels because I want to encounter wild Pokemon throughout the run just to knock them out so that I am going to reach level 90 by the time I face red. That 
That being said, I am repelling in places where the wild Pokemon are completely awful. However, I am not in locations like the sea, where you can fight Pokemon like Mantine, which give good experience yields and are also taking super effective damage from Pichu. Okay, so let's jump ahead to Price. I have fought every trainer in the Rocket Hideout, as well as most of the trainers in Price's gym. I skipped the guy with Swinubs because he's really annoying. They love to use Endure and just waste your time. Price himself, of course, is completely trivial. And then after that, I faced Jasmine. You'll notice here that I have had two more resets against her. That is largely because I don't have great damage ranges against the Magnemites. I have a 55% chance to knock them out in one turn with Mud Slap. As a result, using a Paralyzed Cure Berry is a fairly safe way to go about this fight. You can also use the Soft Sand. I actually just forgot to pick it up in this playthrough. It's really easy not to talk to the trainer after you defeat her and pick it up, so that's a little mistake from me. Either way, it's not going to affect the overall results of the playthrough, because two resets when you're using a Pichu is really just a small drop in a giant ocean. A giant ocean of so much time that I have spent playing this thing. Ah. Oh. Anyways, let's proceed with the run. In the department store, I buy as many vitamins as are possible. So in this case, I get three iron, three calcium, and one protein. By the way, I did also buy an HP up, but I fumbled with my fingers and accidentally used it on one of my HM users. Don't worry, that's also not super important. All right, so let's talk about Pichu's ranges against Claire. Unfortunately, I only have a 64% chance to knock out all the Dragonairs in one hit using Hidden Power Ice when I am not holding the Nevermelt Ice. In this case, I get very lucky and I knock them all out in one hit, so I don't have any problems. It is as if I was holding the Nevermelt Ice, which is something that I also forgot. By the way, the reason I am being so forgetful in this run is specifically because I took so much time off between doing my first and second playthrough and then coming back to do this third playthrough. I just couldn't really cram all of the information in my mind fast enough with enough reliability, so there are a lot of small cracks in my plan that are obviously evident to us now watching the footage. Okay, so now let's talk about Victory Road. Once I defeat the rival here, I am going to grind against wild Pokemon. This is significantly accelerated in comparison with my previous Pichu playthrough because now I have Hidden Power Ice, which is super effective against all of the Pokemon that show up here. They also give decent experience yields for wild Pokemon. My goal level around this training was somewhere between 65 and 68, with 68 being significantly more consistent and 66 being a little bit risky. In the end, I decided to go for the more risky play facing the League at level 66 to hopefully give Pichu a tiny speed boost. The strategy here is fairly simple. I'm using Hidden Power Return and Thundershock for damage and Defense Curl so that I have a way to counter Bruno. After I defeat Will, I teach Rest over Thundershock just so I have Recovery, and then I go up against Bruno. The Recovery is very important here in case Hitmontop gets a crit with Dig, which it does during this fight, but I can just heal and sweep through the rest of his team. After that, I get a very frustrating loss against Karen due to an accuracy drop from Sand Attack. In the next fight, I don't defeat her because the Gengar went for Curse, but I finally managed to defeat defeat her on my third attempt. Lance is incredibly simple. I can just sweep through his team using hidden power. And now, before I go to Kanto, I am heading back to Goldenrod City to use the Move Tutor to teach Pichu Thunderbolt in the place of Defense Curl. In my first playthrough, not having this move really did not help in Kanto. With an electric move in combination with hidden power, Brock is completely trivial. Also, Thunderbolt gives me reliable damage against Blaine's Meg Cargo, so he is also not a problem. Notably, after this fight, I grind on a bunch of trainers east of the gym, which I basically never fight. I didn't even know some of these people were here. I also defeat every single trainer within the Fuchsia City gym before facing Janine. And then I go to Pewter City and all the way over to Mount moon and face the rival here again for more experience. My goal level right now is 79. Once I get Pichu there, I can use 9 rare candies to bring it up to level 88 before facing blue. Being this overleveled means the battle is very easy, I don't have to worry about having a reset here. Well, unless the Arcanine burns me, but luckily for me I have reliable special damage that I can go to as a backup, so I can still win even in that case. The experience from that fight gives me about two-thirds of a level, and I'm gonna need to go up to level 89 against wild Pokémon just outside of Mount Silver. Then I can use the final rare candy that I picked up to bring Pichu to level 90 before I take on Red. My solution for this fight is the generic one. Curse, Return, Protect, and Rest. I can set up on the Pikachu. Once I am fully set up, I try to heal with Rest so that my health is green, and then I can knock the Pikachu out and move on to the Espeon. It is either going to set up Reflect or use Psychic. In this case, it uses Psychic, and I finish it off. 
Then on the Snorlax, because I have a good defense stat, I can use Rest to heal and then return to knock out. All I need to do from here on out is survive one hit from Charizard's Flamethrower, as well as one hit from Blastoise. But in this case, Red actually gives me a gift by sending out the Blastoise first, setting up Rain Dance, and then, once the weather is bad, Charizard comes out and I easily finish him off. I know that fight looked really easy, that's why I wanted to cut levels, and it went really badly for me in my second attempt. But this time, with the higher level, I am able to clock Pichu in with a comparable time. 2 hours, 23 minutes and 57 seconds, with 9 resets at level 90. This is a game time of 9 hours and 7 minutes. So before I place Pichu in my tier list, I want to go through all of the baby's results. After all, this is the final episode in the series, so now is the time to do the deep dive on the data. Here are the splits from all of the baby's first playthroughs. Looking at Alekid, Smoochum, and Magby's results really makes those three feel like they are in a completely different category. And in terms of base stats, they really are, but I also think that their move pools are just significantly better. Cleffa, Togepi, and Iglybuff are sort of in the mid-range for times. It makes sense they're all normal types, and they all play quite similarly. With the notable exception that Cleffa doesn't get really slowed down at the beginning of the game, unlike both Iglybuff and especially Togepi. However, I do think that the inflation of the Faulkner split in this specific run is just because I was a little bit inexperienced with babies. Uh, by the way, I'll just say this now, I haven't said this anywhere else in the series, but uh, I realized that I just got married and then now I'm doing a baby Pokemon series. That is a complete coincidence, by the way. Very seriously, there is no baby announcement. I know some of you predicted that that was going to be the case when I started talking talking about this baby series, so sorry to disappoint. And then in the final category we have both Pichu and Tyrogue, with really long first playthrough times, the only two out of all eight that were above three hours. This graphic shows us level by trainer throughout the playthroughs. I think it's kind of interesting here that they all cluster together. Looking at the level by trainer graph really shows us the fact that Magby, Smoochum, and Alekid are just made differently than the other five. Finally, examining game time by trainer really shows us why Tyrogue was by far the worst. It just really couldn't do anything against Red, and I think that largely comes down to its typing. Like in the Kanto games, the fighting type just doesn't perform very well. Red's Espeon is just so powerful, and it's able to beat the fighting type into submission. Okay, I think that's enough analysis for first playthroughs. Let's now talk about all of their final runs. The split data very clearly demonstrates how far ahead Magby, Elekid, and Smoochum are compared to all of the other babies. It feels like there's a second grouping of Pokemon, Cleffa, Iglybuff, Pichu, and Togepi, which have similar results in terms of time range. Finally, of course, beyond all of these, Tyrogue is definitely the worst baby. Looking at real time by trainer, we can really see the breakaway pack and then the five other babies being grouped together for most of the run. However, because of red, Tyrogue ends up lagging the other four babies by the end of the game. The game time graph is almost exactly the same as the real time graph, so let's go to levels by trainer. This one once again shows a similar story with a breakaway pack and then five Pokemon that lag after that. Interestingly enough here, if you follow Tyrogue's line, you can see that for a while it is a lower level than a lot of the other Pokemon going towards the end game. This is likely due to the fact that it's a medium fast growth rate, plus its late game is highly centralized around Red's Espeon. If that Pokemon, for example, was replaced with Lapras, as is the case in Heart Gold and Soul Silver, I think that Tyrogue would have been able to get better results. I say that thinking that we would just swap out the species. I do know that in Heart Gold and Soul Silver, Red's entire team is at higher levels. That would probably cause more problems for Tyrogue than just one Espeon. It's time to place Pichu in the baby Pokemon tier list, and today it earns the second to last spot. The ranking of all the babies' playthroughs fairly well mirrors their base stat totals, with three exceptions, Magby and Malekid, Cleffa and Togepi, and Pichu and Tyrogue. But the ranking I really care about, of course, is the one in the main tier list. With a time over 2 hours and 15 minutes, Pichu earns itself a spot in the Bruno tier, just behind Wooper and ahead of Mistrovis. By the way, I did that playthrough a long time ago, I'm sure I'm going to have to re-rank it at some point. Do remember that Psy Wave in the early game really holds any Pokemon back. When I started this series, I had a lot of assumptions as to how it would play out. I figured that pretty much every baby Pokemon would get a time over two hours. I also thought all of them would be using Curse in combination with Return to defeat Red. I didn't think these Pokemon would have the ability to teach me something new about Pokemon Crystal, 
and I am very glad that I was wrong. While yes, some of the baby Pokemon did get very bad real times, on the other hand, some Pokemon like Alekid, Magby, and Smoochum really impressed. They did it by achieving great real-time finishes, but also by not relying on Curse against Red. These results taught me something, and that's the fact that base stats don't matter that much in Generation 2. A diverse move pool is really the most important thing to achieve successful results. The NPC Pokémon are just too under-leveled, and overkill is really a major factor when playing with a Pokémon with higher stats. As these videos show, I think even weak Pokémon can have success in Pokémon Crystal, provided they have the type coverage that is required. Unfortunately for our last place finisher Tyrogue, it really lacks coverage, and our first place finisher has all the coverage it could ever want. Thank you so much for joining me on this journey. It has been exhausting, but it's not over yet, because we are going into daily December. Starting on December 1st, and lasting until December 31st, I will be releasing one video every day. You can expect content from all of the games that are currently on rotation in the channel, so Yellow, Crystal, Emerald, and Fire Red. There will be a bunch of solo videos, but also a lot of versus videos. And speaking of those, before the close of November, we're going to get one more. So tomorrow, stay tuned for Starmie vs. Tentacruel in Pokemon Yellow. Thank you so much if you support me directly, it means the world to me. If you've made it this far in the video, you're incredible. I'll see you tomorrow.